So home labs come in all shapes and sizes. You have some that are large server racks that can run enterprise workloads to others that are small and quaint and run just what you need at home. Some home labs are made up of old enterprise gear and some might be old antiquated hardware and others might be made of low powered Raspberry Pis. So if you didn't already know, I also run a home lab. It's comprised of old enterprise gear, old gaming hardware, and some Raspberry Pis too. So if you're interested in home labs and wanna see mine, Join me as we take a tour of my home lab and networking setup. Hey, welcome back. So I'm Techno Tim, and today we're going to take a tour of my home lab. As a quick reminder, I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So if you want to continue the conversation about home labs there, we can. So let's talk about home labs. In my past videos, I've hinted that I've had a home lab. I mean, it's pretty obvious that I have a home lab. I mean, I'm making tutorials about home lab apps to help you self-host some services at home. And throughout all of these tutorials, I've sprinkled in screenshots of my home lab, whether it be my Proxmox servers, some of my network setups, my Raspberry Pis that are also running some workloads, but I've never shown the complete tour of my home lab. I've always felt that I'll show it when I'm ready, when my home lab's mostly complete. But what I realized is that home labs are never complete. They're never totally ready and they're always evolving. And so after I tweeted out a few pics of my home lab and posted it on YouTube, you guys have asked to see my home lab quite a bit. No, like really, you asked a lot. And so I decided that today, we're gonna actually walk through my home lab. And so I'll walk you through my home lab and network setup, but it's obviously not in here, it's in the basement. So let's go down there. Okay, we'll start off with my network rack. Now, as you can tell, this really isn't much of a network rack, but it does serve a purpose. I think most people's networking equipment starts off with kind of humble beginnings and then kind of grows, and that's what this did. This is something I built myself, so when we moved in, I didn't have any networking equipment, and the easiest way was to build my own. I've always mounted my cable modem on the wall. It's always worked better than just putting it on a shelf. But you can see that I totally built this myself. I took some 2x4s, some plywood, I painted it, mounted it to the wall, and then mounted everything I could to it. It's a little messy right now, especially the cords up top. But having everything in a dedicated place sure has been helpful, and it's helped organize some of the cords as well. The power on the top isn't the greatest, but it serves its purpose. It's kind of out of the way, and all the cords are tucked in behind. And then you can see down below, I actually have this little umbilical cord coming out the bottom. And that's this sleeve, this cable management sleeve that I bought that actually works out pretty well. Um, you can tuck all your cables in there, zip it up and tidy them up. So let's take a look at each of these things individually. First, this is my fiber modem. It supports up to a gigabit up and down, which is super nice. We're fortunate enough to have gigabit here in my area, but I only pay for 300 up, 300 down. Saves me 20 bucks a month and I never really use that much. So that's where my internet comes in and we'll skip over my switch and go to my patch panel. So this is a patch panel right here. I put this in, most of this stuff I put in about six years ago. So this patch panel right here is a trip light patch panel. It's only Cat 5e, but that's all I needed to get gigabit. So I'm a huge fan of wired networks. It's not that I like networking, it's just I like the throughput on wired versus wireless. I wired most of my home with Cat 5e. That included a lot of crawling around, cutting holes in walls, accidentally cutting one of my radiator pipes, and then pulling them all down to here. It definitely wasn't fun, but it was so worth it. So this is only a 12 port patch panel. It kind of serves its purpose. Everything from my house comes into here, and then I have jumpers over to my switch. So this is my Cisco switch. It's an SG200 18 port. They're all gigabit. It's a smart switch. So it has 18 ports. They support 10, 100, 1000, so gigabit ethernet on all the ports. It also has these mini GBIC ports, but I don't really use them. And it is a Cisco switch, so you get everything you would expect on a Cisco switch, uh, most of which I don't use. So then coming off this switch goes down to this little switch. This switch is a TP-Link switch. It's an eight port gigabit switch, but it also has four ports of PoE. 
So I really needed the PoE to power some of my cameras. I have PoE cameras all over the house and outside. And so this delivers the network and powers some of those cameras. It was super cheap, it's unmanaged, and it gets the job done. And then you'll see I didn't have a great way to mount this. So I just found these tie straps, bent them, screwed them in, and painted it. So next, this is my HD home run. So this is an HD TC 2 US. It's a dual tuner. So this gives me free over there HD TV. I can watch and record TV in 1080p. And it helps me cut the cable. I haven't had cable for probably 10 years. And I've been running some type of DIY DVR for quite some time. I mean, I was running Windows XP Media Center Edition. That's how long I've been doing DVR on a PC. Um, so yeah, so this records tons of TV. Um, it connects to Plex. And um, this is how I watch all of my PBS. Okay, so then we'll go right above. So this is my Philips Hue hub. This Philips Hue hub controls all of my Philips Hue devices. So that controls a lot of light bulbs. So it controls the color, color temperature, as well as the brightness. And you'll see those lights when I'm streaming or recording. Those are all Philips Hue, so I can adjust them. So I can have my light mode and my dark mode. And they're also paired with the Hue Play. Sometimes I'll turn it on for games, but for most of the time, I just turn it on for a backlight for monitors. Okay, so on this rack, last but not least, this guy, he's pretty important. So this is my Pi Zero. It's a wired model. It's not the wireless. And it has a USB network adapter. So I have a USB adapter that's over here. And so this USB adapter goes from USB to mini USB into this Pi Zero. And this Pi Zero is using one of the cases I put on all of my Raspberry Pis. It's a Zebra Zero case by C4 Labs. It's really awesome. It's clear, looks like ice, and has black. And it's really well constructed. Every Raspberry Pi I have, I buy the Zebra Zero case for it because they're just so fantastic. But this Pi Zero only has a few jobs. Really, it just keeps my home network running. So I wrote some shell scripts for it. All it does is it just pings my servers. If they don't respond, it'll send a wake on LAN packet. So it'll try to wake them up with a magic packet and then ping them again. If they don't respond, it'll keep doing this. Eventually, it'll reset its own network adapter and then reboot itself. And it just does this all day long. And this is just to make sure that my servers are on. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes you have power outages and I have UPSs, but every now and then my servers could go down and this is the little guy that keeps them both on. Super cheap and a great use for a Pi Zero. And so yeah, this is my network rack. It's pretty humble. It started from nothing and grew into this. Eventually, I'll rack all of this in my server rack. But for now, it's on the wall, it's off the ground, it's not on shelves, and it runs really good. And I hope this is a reminder just to let you know that, hey, you don't have to have a network rack to actually build out a network. You can do it with some cheap stuff from Home Depot and Amazon. And although it doesn't look the greatest, it functions really well. So this is my server rack. This is a SysRax 18U four post open frame. So I assembled this myself. It took about three hours to put together. It's super heavy and super solid. It holds everything I need right now. Plus it has an additional 6U that I can expand for later. Plus I might downsize a few things, but we'll get into that later. But I like it. It's, it's great to work on. It's very open. Air can pass through very easily. But at some point I might figure out how to add some panels and maybe add a door to it. But I'll figure that out later. And if not, I'll just try to find one on Craigslist or eBay and then repurpose this one for something else. But this is great for now. Okay, I'm gonna start at the bottom. So the bottom is my UPS. This is the Trip Light 1500 VA Smart UPS battery backup. It's running right at about half capacity, which gives me 10 minutes of battery time. And this is plenty of time if the power goes out to actually shut this down. So I've never had the power go out longer than 10 minutes here yet since I've had this UPS, but it's definitely helped with all the brownouts and power surges that we've had here lately, as well as all the thunderstorms that have been shutting the power off for just a couple of seconds. So this does have a USB cable that I can plug into my server, and then I can shut it down if I'm running on battery power too long, but I've yet to hook that up. I probably should do that. Okay, I'll just work my way up the rack. So next, this is my NetApp disk array shelf. This is the DS4246. I got it off of eBay and it's fantastic. So I got the model that ends in six. That's because it supports six gigabit on the SATA speeds. And as you can see, if you couldn't tell from my social media post, I finally added some labels to this. It was kind of a nightmare trying to figure out which drive was which when I was having problems, but I no longer have that problem. So as you can see, it can hold up to 24 drives, which is really awesome. 
This gives me a lot of room for expansion later on. But for now, I've only populated six drives. So I have six drives in here. They're the eight terabyte Seagate Iron Wolves. They're made specifically for NAS and they've been running pretty good so far. I did have some problems with two drives that were throwing some errors, but Seagate quickly replaced them and shipped them to me ahead of time. So that was really awesome of them to do that. And so you're probably wondering, what does the connection type look like from this to my server? Well, it's connected via an LSI HBA external SAS PCIe controller. So this gives me an external SAS interface that I can connect using QSFP to a mini SAS. It was kind of challenging finding the right cable and they're kind of expensive. But this disc shelf so far was totally worth it overall. Okay, working my way up the rack again. So this is my Dell R710 server. I bought this server on Amazon refurbished. So this is a fantastic server if you're looking for some old enterprise retired gear. This one right here is pretty much maxed out. And the reason why I bought on Amazon is because this one actually had a warranty on the whole entire server. I know I could have gone to eBay and parted it out all individually, but honestly, I really didn't want to put in the time to track everything down individually and then put it together and hope it all worked. So yeah, I picked it up on Amazon and it works fantastic. But anyways, yeah, it's almost maxed out. So it has dual Xeons, X5670s, and they're 2.93 gigahertz. So each Xeon has six cores plus hyper-threading. So that's 24 logical cores. So you get 12 physical and 12 virtual. It came with 144 gigs of registered ECC RAM. So that's pretty much maxed out. And then in here, it also came with six two terabyte drives, but I outgrew them rather quickly. So I've replaced all six of these with 500 gig SSDs and they're in a RAID 10. So it did come with a RAID adapter and I'm using that RAID adapter to do a RAID 10. So RAID one plus zero. So that gives me a Stripe plus parity. And all of this SSD storage is for my virtual machines. Oh, and also this right here, this is not the optical drive. So if you press this button, it's not gonna work. So the optical drive used to be there. And I found this really awesome drive caddy that you can replace your optical drive and put in another solid state drive. That's the drive that runs the OS, which this is running Proxmox. So if you have a server and you have an optical drive and you aren't using it, I highly recommend getting a caddy and putting another hard drive in there. So this Dell server also came with the iDRAC, the integrated Dell remote access controller. And this allows me to connect to it remotely if it's shut down, allows me to flash the firmware, and I can even reinstall the OS remotely by mounting an ISO, but I don't use it that often. But it's nice knowing it's there and I can use it if I need to. So this came with a quad gigabit NIC, but I've also installed another dual gigabit NIC that my network firewall uses for the LAN and the WAN port. But that's pretty much all this server does. It runs lots of virtual machines and very fast. And most of that hardware is passed through to the guests. Okay, next up the rack, this is a Chenbro rack mount for you server chassis. So this doesn't really look like enterprise gear, does it? This is actually my old gaming PC that I converted to a server. So this case is really awesome. It's a 4U rack mount. There's lots of room. It has eight full height expansion slot. It also has a front panel here too. And if you haven't noticed, there's like a freaking laser beam shooting out the front. You don't want to look directly in this because it's super duper bright. But I have front panel access to buttons, has some blinky lights, USB, all the normal stuff you would see on a PC case. It has a fan right here too, and a filter that I can clean out, but there's not that much dust here in my basement. Okay, so let's take a look inside. All right, so here's the awesome thing about this case. So it's pretty much a PC inside of a case. So for reference, this is my old server. This is the case that I removed all of this hardware from. It's the Corsair Air 540 High Airflow ATX Cube case. It's a super nice case. It's all black, it's pretty sleek, has a nice window, lots of room for drives, lots of room for customization, and great airflow. And it has dust filters. So if you're planning on building a NAS or a server sometime, you could get something like this. It's great if you're just starting out. So yeah, I took all of that hardware and transferred it into this case. So back to this Chenbro case. It's really great, super roomy. I bought it used and it didn't come with any fans. It should have came with a fan, so Amazon refunded a little bit to me which was perfect because I just replaced it with some Noctua fans. So those fans back there are 80 millimeter Noctua fans. And then I have a 120 millimeter fan up here and that's Noctua as well. So about this build, this is my old gaming PC. So this is the Intel Core i7-4790K. So this is the Haswell. I think it was codenamed Devil's Canyon. It has four cores, eight threads, 
So for a long time, this was one of the fastest stock clocks you could get on a core. And it turbos up to 4.4, but that's not really needed. So this processor supports VTX and VTD, so I can virtualize things and actually pass hardware through. So this is all plugged into my ASUS motherboard. This is the ASUS Z87 Pro. It was a premium board at the time, and it also supports VT-D, which is nice, and it has some pretty quality components. You can see all of the nice heat spreaders and they're nice and gold and black. And so this turned out to be a nice little server build. So in here I have some Samsung 500 gig SSDs for my VMs and I used an adapter to get them in the five and a quarter bay. And if we look back there on the left, you can see a pair of video cards. So this one right here is the MSI GTX 1050 overclocked edition. And you can also see it doesn't draw any external power and that was on purpose. So really I just needed the NVENC encoder off of this card. This is the older NVENC, it's the Pascal architecture, but it's perfect for what I needed to do. So this actually runs the 24 hour mixer stream. It's always on. Rip mixer. So now that mixer isn't around anymore, I'll try to figure out something to do with this card. Okay, so to the right, this is the Zotac Gaming GeForce GTX 1650 overclock. I also use the NVENC encoder on this, but this has the new touring architecture. So this one right here runs my Twitch stream. That's a 24 hour always on stream. And you can tell on this one too, it does not require external power, which was on purpose. Both of these draw all the power they need from the PCI Express slots. Okay, and then you can see here is my RAM. So I just have 32 gigs of DDR3. And that's really all I need for this server. This server only runs two virtual machines. Each virtual machine has a video card passed through it. And then I assign 12 gigs of RAM to each, which is plenty for these virtual machines. And this is my second Proxmox server. So I hope you enjoyed the tour of my home lab. It's nowhere near complete, but most aren't. And you can see in my home lab that it's been an evolving process. I started out building my home lab thinking it was going to go one way, and then I needed to make some drastic changes and start racking in a rack mount server. And then I converted old PCs to rack mount cases and rack those. So I'm kind of in between from where I was to where I wanna be. But I hope that shows you that not everything needs to be buttoned up before you try. I felt that way for a long time before sharing this video with you, but I realized sharing it now might be the best thing to do so that in the future I can go back and look at this and say, hey, this is how it was and this is how it is now. So what's next for my home lab? Well, I'd like to get a rack mount patch panel. I'd love to run all my network cables down to that patch panel. And then from there, I'd love to add a 10 gigabit switch. I'm kind of holding out for RJ45 and copper, but we'll see how that goes. And then from there, who knows? I may scale down, I may scale up. But that's the beauty of home labs. They evolve as your needs evolve. So in case you didn't notice, this was just the physical setup of how my home lab is set up. In a future video, I'll walk through all of the software and services that are running on each machine so that you can understand the types of workloads that are running on that hardware. And if this is something you'd like to see, let me know in the comments section below. And while you're in the comments, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. So thanks so much for watching and till next time, Stream on, my friends. Yeah, so I, that's that's kind of like my my intersection of things I like. You know, it's this tech plus hosting and sharing plus gaming. Like that's my wheelhouse. I mean, that's half the reason why I start this YouTube channel uh, is because of just that. But yeah, so same thing with like my Discord bots. Like for me, that's like totally like I love it because it's like. I get to build a Discord bot, um, it's writing code, then I get to host it in my own infrastructure, and then I get to share it, and then it's in my server, so, and it's in the, in the gaming genre. So yeah, so, I don't know, gonna give it a spin, we'll see how it goes.